When it comes to new G.I. Joe recruits, it's all about the gimmicks. You've got to have an exposed tattooed chest, a cool in-your-face action pose, an animal sidekick, hell even a sports-themed uniform just to stand out above the rest. Because unless your name is Duke, Scarlet, or Snake Eyes, you're most likely going to be forgotten once the next batch of shiny new characters gets introduced in the following year. But the reality is, is that there are only so many gimmicks out there. So thinking out of the box or maybe just out of sheer desperation, I guess the boys at Hasbro figured that bright pink flowers would make a great first impression. In my opinion, 1987 was a relatively strong year for G.I. Joe as there were a good number of colorful and cool looking characters introduced. We got Lieutenant Falcon, the Green Beret who was prominently featured in the animated Joe movie also released that year. Voiced by Don Johnson and who was later revealed to be G.I. Joe poster boy Duke's half-brother. We also got another ninja, Jinx, who was trained by the Arashikagi clan's blind master and was one of the newer characters introduced in 2013's live-action retaliation movie played by Elodie Young. There was also the explosive ordnance disposal specialist Tunnel Rat, whose face likeness was famously modeled after the godfather of G.I. Joe, Larry Hama. And of course, we can't forget my namesake Joe, Mr. Christopher Levine, aka the MP Law and his loyal canine partner, Order. But when I first looked at the 1987 card back, there was one particular Joe that easily caught my attention above everyone else. Unfortunately, it was for the wrong reasons. Amidst all the cool looking Joes was a guy proudly sporting a bright blue shirt with some pink splotches that initially I couldn't quite make out. Upon closer inspection, I realized that they were flowers? And to top it all off, his code name was Chuckles? Huh? As hard as I tried, I just couldn't wrap my head around this new Joe. What the hell was Chuckles supposed to be? Of course, I tried to rationalize his existence. I thought maybe the flowers on his shirt were some sort of exotic camouflage? He must be some sort of jungle warfare specialist. Maybe Chuckles meant that he was a nunchuck specialist. I know that was kind of a stretch, but hey, I was a kid. Back then, I had no idea what Hasbro was thinking when they created this guy, and it frustrated me to high heavens. Of course, ultimately, this didn't really deter me from getting his toy when I got the chance. Unfortunately though, even having the toy in hand didn't endear him to me any better. I did learn that his specialty was being an undercover agent, which I guess was cool, but it didn't really explain to me why he had pink flowers on his shirt, unless he was meant to go undercover exclusively at Hawaiian luau parties or something. Which I guess wasn't too far off the mark since, as an adult, I figured that his floral attire was most likely inspired by the popular 80s television character Magnum P.I., played by the actor Tom Selleck, who was a private investigator based in Hawaii and was known for his floral fashion. Anyway, flowers aside, Chuckles' action figure was rather light in the accessory department as well. All he had was a pistol and a strap-on holster. Granted, having a holster that could actually house his pistol was kinda cool. I could be wrong, but I think he was the first Joe figure to actually sport a functional holster. It just wasn't enough to keep me interested though, and he was soon a forgotten member of my Joe ranks. Years later though, Chuckles would get a bunch of modern updates. He was thrown in at the tail end of the 25th anniversary line in an exclusive multi-figure pack. And while his update mysteriously lacked the pink flowers, he still sported a bright blue shirt, this time with lush green leaves. We also got a Night Force version of Chuckles with further muted down colors. Thankfully, this version had a more standard issue military vest. But if you look close enough, you'll notice that his gray shirt underneath is still sporting some white flowers. To his credit, Chuckles was one of the handful of new Joes introduced in the 1987 animated movie. He belonged to a team of fresh recruits fittingly referred to as the Rawhides. Unfortunately, his undercover specialty was never utilized or even alluded to. In fact, he was curiously portrayed as a silent and almost Herculean strongman. He made his mark by displaying incredible bordering on comical feats of physical strength, which included blowing up an oncoming his tank by literally picking up and throwing a missile by hand at it, successfully jump-starting a Tomahawk helicopter by getting on the roof and giving the huge rotor a spin. He also proceeded to stay on the roof of the copter with the rotor spinning inches above his head as it flew into battle, calmly shooting at enemy jets with his trusty pistol. Oh, and he also took out three dreadnoughts with one punch. Amazing. I guess you could say that he was actually operating undercover. 
as He-Man. Anyway, while his character was portrayed a little more accurately to his file card specialty in the original Marvel comics, to be honest, there really wasn't much that would really make this character stand out in the minds of many fans, including myself. And it seemed that his ultimate fate would be to inevitably wilt away like the flowers in his shirt and be one in a long list of forgotten Joes. That is, until a Hail Mary play from comics company IDW catapulted Chuckles from obscurity into one of the most popular and dare I say, iconic characters in the entire franchise. Best known for the grittier, more real-world take on the G.I. Joe franchise, in 2009, IDW launched a rather ambitious miniseries simply called Cobra. The premise was pretty straightforward. It would feature a Joe infiltrating Cobra initially as a lowly recruit and slowly working his way up the elite inner circle. What made this more interesting was that in the IDW universe, Cobra was a totally different animal. Instead of being the in-your-face villainous organization relying on contraptions like mass devices and weather dominators to take over the world, IDW's Cobra is an ultra-clandestine organization working in the shadows, destabilizing governments all over the world. As far as the general population was concerned, Cobra didn't exist, and to a highly specialized military and intelligence team like G.I. Joe, they were a whisper, a scary rumor, a dangerous mystery that needed to be cracked. So when selecting the Joe who would star in the series, writers Christos Gage and Mike Costa revealed in interviews that they wanted to stay away from the usual favorites like Snake Eyes, Scarlet, or Roadblock. Instead, they wanted to go with someone less known. In what would eventually become a common practice with this writing duo, they sought to get the lamest Joe character in existence and tried to make him cool. Going down the list of names, Chuckles immediately got their attention. And when they found out that his specialty just happened to be undercover, well, they knew they had their guy. Now before we go any further, I guess it goes without saying that we are now moving into spoiler territory. If you haven't read IDW's Cobra series and have plans to do so, turn back now. Instead, what you can do is subscribe to my channel and check out other stories from my toy shelf. It would be much appreciated. And even if you do decide to push through with my condensed version of the Cobra story, don't let that stop you from subscribing either. And if you already have, thank you and please spread the word. Anyway, back to Cobra. So as the story goes, Chuckles, already an undercover agent with a number of assignments under his belt, such as arms trafficking in Laos, working with the Taliban as well as Colombian drug lords, is given his latest mission by the head of G.I. Joe, General Hawk. As part of his cover, he is fired from the Joe team and even ends up taking out a couple of them in a staged raid in Russia in order to gain the trust of his Cobra recruiter. Eventually, he makes it in, with his only contact with the outside world being his handler and fellow Joe operative, Jinx, whom he eventually gets intimately involved with, and General Hawk himself, his main assignment being to infiltrate, observe, and report, using a very crude skeletal resonance receiver implanted in his skull, which basically enabled him to communicate using coded dot and dash messages. Chuckles eventually works his way up the ranks, doing stuff that, let's say, isn't up to par with what a real American hero would do, until he is assigned to work directly under an inner circle member, an individual named Mr. X, and is also introduced to his adjunct, a Miss Erica Leten, half-sister of the Baroness, whom he eventually gets intimately involved with. What can I say? The guy's a charmer. Anyway, the very bad things Chuckle does within the organization continue to escalate up until the point wherein his handler and lover, Jinx, is captured and he is forced to murder her in cold blood in order to maintain his cover. Being forced to kill Jinx makes this mission extremely personal to Chuckles and he vows to go the extra mile and take the whole Cobra operation down. In the last issue of the miniseries, Chuckles finally makes his move, confronting the mysterious Mr. X, who turns out to be two people, identical twins Tomax and Zaymot Pauli, better known to Joe fans as the Crimson Twins or Crimson Guard Commanders. It is further revealed that they were aware of Chuckles' true allegiance very early on and were merely using him to make G.I. Joe think that they were successfully infiltrating and taking out strategic Cobra bases, which in reality were already redundant and decommissioned sites. Oh, and the Jinx test? Well, that was just the twins wanting to completely mess with him. Anyway, in the end, Chuckles manages to take down the current Crimson Twins Battalion Automation Tactics, or BATS, operation, but both Tomax and Samot escape. But not before Chuckles manages to give Samot his famous facial scar that in all G.I. Joe media was the only physical differentiator from his twin. 
The series turned out to be a critically acclaimed hit that year, and to no one's surprise spawned the second miniseries to continue Chuckles' story. The second series picks up a year later with Hawk recruiting a new operative, Jinx lookalike Chameleon, to find and retrieve Chuckles who has gone missing since taking down the Crimson Twins' bat operation. On the Cobra side, things have changed as well as due to their loss with Chuckles, both Tomax and Zemot and by association Erika Leten had lost considerable favor with the true headsnake Cobra Commander. Worse yet, the twins themselves, having previously been inseparable, have now splintered. Due to his near-death experience at the hands of Chuckles, Seymot had begun a downward spiral exhibiting more reckless behavior and further weakening his and Tomax's position in the Cobra inner circle. Anyway, Chameleon eventually finds Chuckles in a remote Russian prison where he is biding his time and working on a way to get back at the twins for the death of Jinx and, well, burn the entire Cobra operation down to the ground. He convinces Chameleon into giving him more time to gather more intelligence on Cobra. Despite his best efforts though, Cobra still sees Chuckles coming a mile away and basically sends in a squad of vipers to kill him. Chuckles narrowly manages to defeat them, sustaining multiple injuries and ultimately being saved by Chameleon. He refuses to come back with Chameleon though, intent on finding his way to still take down Cobra. Figuring him a lost cause, Chameleon agrees and returns to Hawk with a technically more valuable asset, Erika Leten, who in an act of self-preservation defects to the side of the Joes. Alone and bleeding to death, Chuckles, with only one thing on his mind, slowly makes his way on foot through the wilderness towards the Cobra base. Unsurprisingly, he doesn't make it and collapses into unconsciousness, only to wake up hours later in a comfortable bed, wounds properly cleaned up, and in the presence of none other than Cobra Commander. And with that, ends the second miniseries. The final chapter of Chuckles' story is wrapped up in the now ongoing Cobra series, wherein Cobra Commander, who is mightily impressed with everything Chuckles has done up to this point, sets off to truly convert him into the Cobra side as he jets him off to a secret base of operations in a nondescript island off the coast of Japan. And in an act of complete hubris, the commander offers Chuckles a high-ranking position next to him in his inner circle, carefully grooming him to eventually replace the increasingly unreliable and unpredictable Zemot and by association Tomax, who he secretly offers up to Chuckles to kill as incentive when the time is right. As the series progresses in a bid to be free from his cobra shackles and master of his own fate, an increasingly unstable Zemot orchestrates a coup to take down the commander and conveniently lay the blame on Chuckles. But in the final act, Chuckles flips the script and manages to accomplish what no Joe has ever been able to do before, decorate the cobra throne room walls with cobra commander's brain. And of course, blame it all on Zemot. In the end, with no place left to go, both Chuckles and Seymot end up inside a nuclear sub docked underneath the island. Seymot, of course, has every intention to use the sub to make his escape, and given that he is the only one capable of piloting said sub, assumes that Chuckle has no choice but to keep him alive. Unfortunately for Seymot though, Chuckles has other plans. Having killed the commander and avenged his lover Jinx, Chuckles is done, and then proceeds to detonate the nuclear sub, killing Seymot himself, hundreds of Cobra operatives, and destroying a multi-billion dollar Cobra installation. Mission accomplished. Or is it? In the aftermath, it is revealed that despite Chuckles' best effort, the Cobra organization survives and moves on. In a span of a mere 24 months, a new, more ruthless Cobra commander rises to the top and leads Cobra out of the shadows and into a full-blown military power and political influence on the world stage. It never ends, does it? Anyway, with the deepest respect, of course, to everything ever written by Larry Hama in the original Marvel run and beyond, I'm sure that I'm not the only fan out there who regards most of IDW's G.I. Joe run as one of the best ever written for the franchise, with ironically a series titled Cobra firmly on top. And of course, in the middle of it all is the Joe named Chuckles, handpicked for the series due to the absurdity of his name and the flowers on his shirt. Now I can't confirm it, but I wouldn't be surprised if the original idea for Chuckles started out as a joke or a last minute throw in by Hama and company. But even if it was, I think it's safe to say that he's far outgrown his rather unspectacular origins and as I said earlier, thanks to the excellent Cobra series, become one of the most popular Joes out there with plans of a live action movie heavily featuring him supposedly in the works. Although, after this debacle, 
I'm not quite sure that's ever gonna happen. But speaking of the Snake Eyes origin movie, I just want to say that this guy, Andrew Koji, the guy who played Storm Shadow, is awesome. And if you haven't yet, do yourself a favor and check out the series Warrior on Netflix. But back to Chuckles. Regardless of what you think of him or his sense of fashion, you can't deny that he is one of the best written and developed Joe characters of all time. Like I said, he may have started out as a joke, but at the end of the day, it looks like this guy definitely got the last laugh. So are there any other fans of the Joe named Chuckles? Anyone else share the same taste for floral attire? Or what other Joes or Cobras, in your opinion, deserve to have a whole mini-series or series dedicated to them? Let me know in the comments below and tell me your story. Thanks for watching Stories from the Toy Shelf. If you enjoyed this story, why not check another one? And please help me out by giving me a like or comment and subscribe to the channel to get notifications whenever I upload a new story. Until the next one.